Okay, thanks very much for the privilege to speak here. So this is work in progress in collaboration with Lorenzo Di Pietro from the Weizmann Institute. So uh, in conformal filters uh, in D dimensions, it's a generally interesting quantity to take all the operators of the theory, uh, compute their dimensions, and uh, form a statistical sum uh, of the type e to the minus beta delta, where delta is the dimension of the operator. So that gives you an interesting function of beta that uh, uh, can be used to, for example, estimate how many operators of large dimensions there are, how the density of operators behaves, and so on. Now, this object has a nice pass integral uh, representation as a pass integral over the generalized d-dimensional cylinder, which is the d-1-dimensional sphere times a circle, where the circle has radius beta. And you have to be sure that the fermion, fermionic boundary conditions are anti-periodic so that you don't get this sum with minus 1 to the f. Of course, you can also study this sum with minus 1 to the f, which uh, is very important in various contexts, like including in non-supersymmetric conformal filters. So depending on the boundary conditions on the circle, you can study this or the other sum that is related by minus 1 to the f. Now, if you take the temperature to be very, very large, so namely beta going to 0, uh, it's very easy to extract the asymptotic behavior of this partition function or this statistical sum because locally it looks like flat space times a circle. So you expect to find something that goes like temperature to the power little d. So in four dimensions it would be temperature cubed. And then there is the volume of the d-dimensional sphere and there is some coefficient kappa. This coefficient kappa in two dimensions is known to be very simple. That's the Cardi formula in two dimensions. It's, it's completely fixed by the central charges of the underlying two-dimensional conformal field theory. In higher dimensions, this, uh, quantity, <coughs> this quantity kappa cannot be quite so simple, so it cannot be fixed by the anomalies of the underlying four-dimensional theory. For example, because we know, of, we know of many cases in which it depends on exactly marginal parameters, while the anomalies that we know do not depend on exactly marginal parameters. So such a simple formula as Hardy's formula is, seems impossible in higher dimensions. Now, the, what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, I will combine some ideas which are old and new in hydrodynamics with some ideas in supersymmetric filters or and in general in quantum field theory to derive several new results. Uh, some of them are in the context of just plain ordinary hydrodynamics, uh, fi fi finite uh, uh, thermal systems and so on. And some results which I'll emphasize more strongly are in the context of such partition functions in higher dimensional field theories. And especially I'll focus on these high temperature limits. So just as a, uh, as a as a, as a maybe note of caution, sometimes I'll say high temperature, even though this circle will have periodic boundary conditions. But you'll see in which case I use this notion. So one object that I'll study and emphasize is uh, SOSI partition functions on spaces that look like three manifolds time circles. And these circles have a radius beta, or one over the temperature. So if you compute partition functions of supersymmetric filters on such spaces, you get a similar partition function to the one that I've just discussed but there is a minus one to the fermion number. So you sum over the Hilbert space of uh, states over this three manifold, and the Hamiltonian is some object H, and you just do this uh, partition function. Okay, now what do we know about the limit of such partition functions when the temperature goes to infinity? One thing that is obvious, uh, quite, this is quite obvious is that this volume term that we've encountered in general quantum field theory without, without the minus one to the F is not going to be present. Uh, intuitively, this is because this volume term is more or less associated to some cosmological constant which vanishes in supersymmetric theories. So the asymptotic behavior of these partition functions of supersymmetric theories over arbitrary three manifolds time circles do not contain this uh, volume term. So they have some subleading terms which are interesting to think about. So one of the results that I would like to derive, and you'll see that it goes through a pretty complicated path that involves hydrodynamics and so on, so one of the results that I will claim is that when you take the circle to be very small, or if you want the temperature to be very large, these partition functions have a universal asymptotic behavior, which does not contain the volume term, but it contains a length scale, L, which you can compute in a way that I'll explain. And there is some temperature, a linear, linear dependence in the temperature. And more interestingly, this coefficient kappa prime is completely fixed by the anomalies of the underlying four-dimensional field theory. So this is very much reminiscent of uh, Cardi's formula in two dimensions, and it's applicable even when the three-manifold is a three-sphere. For example, when the three-manifold is a three-sphere, 
then this partition function has an interpretation in terms of counting operators, very much like in Cardi's case, in two dimensions. And this formula has various implications about the structure of BPS operators uh, in supersymmetric filters that I'll discuss. So this is the universal formula that I will explain or prove. And uh, there are several ingredients. So let us start from just general quantum filter, no supersymmetry. And I will assume that there is a U1 symmetry. Uh, also, I'll put some temperature. I'll study this uh, system at finite temperature, T, which is 1 over beta. And if we want to compute correlation functions at finite temperature, one convenient way of doing that is to couple the system to background fields. So for example, we can couple this uh, quantum field theory with temperature T to some background metric or to some background gauge field. And then taking derivatives with respect to these quantities, we can generate correlation functions at finite temperature. So uh, <clears throat> just to simplify a little bit the discussion, the background fields that I will include are the gauge field and the metric, but I will assume that their temperature does not depend on space. So we'll think about R3 times S1 with some non-trivial metric on R3 times S1, but there will be no G0 component to the metric just for simplicity. So the main thing at thermal filter, that the main thrust is that you get local effective actions. So we know quantum filter in some thermal background is supposed to be gapped because uh, everything is sort of screened by the plasma. And uh, so you expect to find local quantum filters in three dimensions. So four dimensional quantum filter at finite temperature for some type of questions can be described perfectly well by a local three dimensional quantum filter for the background fields. Uh, and from that, you can then take derivatives and generate correlation functions at zero Matsubara frequency and arbitrary, and arbitrary small momentum. So if you, now you just have to classify uh, admissible effective actions in terms of these background fields. At zero derivatives, you just find some function of A0 and the temperature, where A0 is the chemical potential. This is the component of the gauge field along the thermal circle. At one derivative, you find a bunch of churn simons terms, and that's where it becomes interesting. So you can start asking, what do we know about the coefficients of these churn simons terms? So in, at one derivative, to be more precise, you find three churn simons terms, C1, C2, and C3. They're they, they quite different. I'll explain the differences between them. And then there is one more interesting churn simons term that I'll mention, which has three derivatives. This little f in the three derivatives churn simons term is just the field strength of the kk photon little a. So when we, have, when we decompose the metric of R3 times S1, into variables that are convenient in R3, there is the, this important kk photon, little ai. So that will be an important gauge field in three dimensions that you have to re remember. OK. Now, the churn simons terms C1 and C2 uh, look very funny. They look like field-dependent churn simons terms because they contain the chemical potential, which can be an arbitrary function of space in the context of hydrodynamics. So these are not ordinary churn simons terms that we will write as three-dimensional field theories. They're not gauge invariant even under small gauge transformations. But if you remember, the four-dimensional theory that we started from may have various anomalies. So this non-gauge invariant churn simons term, C1 and C2, are just fixed. The coefficient C1 and C2 are just completely fixed in terms of the U1 cubed anomaly of the associated U1 symmetry. <clears throat> so this, the coefficient C1 and C2 are in field-dependent churn simons terms, and we can more or less immediately fix these coefficients by anomaly matching. This is not anomaly matching of the Tuff type. This is anomaly matching across dimensions. And it can be done. It makes sense. So in thermal field theory at very high temperatures, some correlation functions must be fixed by the anomalies of the underlying four-dimensional field theory. So this is the anomaly matching at finite temperature, if you want. OK. Now, this three-derivative churn simons term uh, is also not gauge invariant, because the field strength of the KK photon is not uh, generally annihilated if you do a gauge transformation here. And this is similarly fixed by uh, the U1 gravitational anomaly of the underlying four-dimensional theory. So this coefficient is also very easy to extract just by matching anomalies at finite temperature. OK, so the last standing churn simons term, and this is the most interesting one and the most puzzling one, is the one that involves the gauge field A in three dimensions and the field strength of the KK photon. So A wedge D little a. This one is completely gauge invariant under small gauge transformations. So its coefficient cannot be fixed by just a, by alluding to simple-minded anomaly matching in thermal field theory. So this led to quite some work in the literature, this Chern-Simons term. In particular, uh, it was studied in various examples 
And even though there is no a priori reason why it should be fixed by any anomaly of the underlying four-dimensional theory, all the examples that people studied, including at weak coupling and at strong coupling, were consistent with this magic formula. The this coefficient is, in fact, fixed by a gravitational uh, U1 anomaly. That's very puzzling. And there were proposals for how to generalize it to higher dimensions, to other dimensions, other even dimensions. So there is this uh, two-point function in thermal field theory, which has just one power of momentum, which uh, is completely fixed by the U1 gravitational anomaly. And it's not, completely cl it's not clear why this should be the case. Let me give you an example that really demonstrates this uh, uh, amusing result. Take a massless free fermion in some finite temperature. A massless free fermion at finite temperature leads to a gap theory in three dimensions because we just have uh, anti periodic, we have anti periodic boundary conditions, so there are no zero modes. And now you can try to compute this Chern Simons terms. It's an easy exercise in free field theory. So in three dimensions, we have an infinite tower of massive fermions, starting from some mass which is a half in the kk units. And if we integrate out each one of these kk states, we get a perfectly correctly quantized Chern Simons term, a wedge d little a, with some integer coefficients in some units. So this is exactly what you would expect. When you sum over these guys, over all the kk states, you have an infinite sum. So you have three-dimensional field theory with infinitely many fields. When you sum over n, you get the magic, using the magic formula, you get the 1 over 12. So, and you see that this 1 over 4 pi times 1 over 12 accounts for the 1 over 48 pi u1 in the conjecture. And so you get the chern simons term, with, which agrees with that formula. And also, it's not correctly quantized. So this chern simons term is confusing from the point of view of three-dimensional field theory because it's quantized incorrectly in some units of 12. OK, so how do we prove this relation between uh, this thermal correlation function, this thermal two-point function, and anomalies? So if you are satisfied with Lagrangian field theories, so any quantum field theory which has a Lagrangian, the proof is actually straightforward, just from what I said before. The proof uh, depends on two steps. One is that you observe the this and simons term so this chern simons term, C3, cannot depend continuously on any coupling constant. Because if it depended on any coupling constant, then you could have thought that this you could promote this coupling constant from a constant to a function. And then you would violate gauge invariance. And there would be no anomaly to account for that. So this chern simons term cannot depend on coupling constants. So in any Lagrangian field theory, you can just zoom to the free field theory point, which exists by definition because the theory is Lagrangian. And then use the fact that anomalies do not change as a function of the couplings. And you therefore uh, establish that this coefficient is given by minus 1 over 48 pi times the U1 gravitational anomaly. So you use the fact that for free fermions, the conjecture works. And that in Lagrangian filters, you can prove that it doesn't depend on any coupling constant. So for Lagrangian filters, it's easy, more or less easy to establish this result, even though the, you, you could have said that the proof is not very enlightening. Now, uh, in the non-perturbative regime, this is a challenge which is much more formidable. And there have been some arguments in the literature by the group of Jensen, Logonaya, Gam, and Yarom, where they placed thermal field theory in some, conical deficit, in some backgrounds with some conical deficit. And they tried to argue that there is some decoupling of states, and there are some localized states that don't contaminate the results too much, and so on. And in that way, they were able to derive this formula, assuming various uh, properties of quantum field theory in singular geometries. If I have time at the end of my talk, uh, I'll show you a non-perturbative proof that does not involve any singular geometries. And it's a very cute proof that, in, that, sim that is very similar in spirit to various results that Cardi derived in two dimensions by mo modular invariance, exchanging some circles. So I will not go, I'll not, I don't want uh, to spend too much time on that now, but just uh, keep moving to the applications for supersymmetry. So you should uh, consider this result, as, uh, this result as established, that CS3 is minus 1 over 48 pi times u1. For Lagrangian filters, the argument is straightforward. Non-perturbatively, there is an argument in the end of the slides, if you want to look later, that, the, that shows that. OK, so uh, let us now try to see what this new lessons from thermal field theory, which are generally valid in any quantum field theory, teach us about supersymmetric partition functions. <coughs> So one obstacle in applying these results to supersymmetric partition functions is that uh, in thermal field theory, it was extremely important that the field theory that you get in three dimensions after you've reduced on the circle is a local field theory, because, the, because thermal field theory is supposed to lead to a gapped system. In supersymmetric field theory, of course, one of the uh, claims to fame is that, the is that the boundary conditions for fermions are periodic. And therefore, you have a massless sector, 
on the three manifold. So it would seem that the full effective action is non-local and all of these developments are of no use in supersymmetric filters on M3 times S1. However, let us be naive and try to supersymmetrize this chern simons term that we've just derived. So, the, so in the context of supersymmetry, there is a natural U1 symmetry, that is the R symmetry, and we can just try to use fa on phase value the results from the previous discussion for non-supersymmetric filters, ig ignoring the issue with non-locality that I will address momentarily. So if you can just supersymmetrize this term, and supersymmetry relates this term Simon's term to various other terms, most importantly, including the Einstein-Hilbert term in three dimensions. So if you believe that the coefficient of this chern simons term is indeed universal and it's fixed by this gravitational anomaly, uh, then you immediately led to the, you're immediately led to the conclusion that the Einstein-Hilbert term is also fixed in terms of the trace U1 anomaly in four dimensions for supersymmetric field theories. Now this field H is some background field in the, supergravi in the appropriate supergravity multiplet in three dimensions that I am not going to go into. The most important lesson from here is that this chern simons term is in the same multiplet as the Einstein-Hilbert term. So if you know one, you know the other. Now, somebody who is doing physics in three dimensions, per se, uh, would have said that this counter term, that this is just a counter term for linear divergences that are often encountered in three-dimensional partition functions. So if you compute partition functions in three dimensions with or without supersymmetry, you often encounter linear divergences. And for three-dimensional physicists, this term would be completely uninteresting. It just soaks up the linear divergence. However, since our starting point is a four-dimensional quantum filter, then this is not a good counter term, and it's calculable. So we can really claim that its coefficient is completely fixed, because it's not a good counter term in the underlying Lorentz invariant four-dimensional field theory. OK. Now, uh, let me just say a few words that are not on the slides of why, even though the effective action is non-local, okay, we can still trust this local term. The reason is basically because the, uh, this term, by dimensional analysis, has a power of the temperature. So there is like, uh, it's proportional to temperature. This uh, chern simons term was also proportional to temperature in the previous discussion. Now, the massless field theory that remains after you've, after you've compactified on a circle does not know about temperature. Temperature is not a quantum number. Or, any, or a parameter in the Lagrangian for the massless field theory, because the massless field theory has already forgotten about this circle. So the partition function of this massless field theory, even though it leads to a non-local effective action, does not contaminate terms that are proportional to temperature. So this is why, since we're just interested in the lowest possible term in, derivative, in the derivative expansion, this is fine. So it cannot be contaminated by the massless field theory. OK, so since the Einstein-Hilbert term is completely universal, it's fixed by an anomaly, <laughs> as these discussions would imply, uh, we can now uh, infer that the high temperature limit of supersymmetric partition functions, where you sum over the Hilbert space of some theory in a three manifold with some Hamiltonian and minus one to the fermion number, should, in the high temperature limit, just go over to some exponent in which the numerator is exactly the U1R gravitational anomaly. And it's also proportional to some length scale, where the length scale is, roughly speaking, the integral over the, of the Einstein-Hilbert term over this three manifold. So this gives you uh, a non-perturbative uh, asymptotic formula for any supersymmetric field theory uh, on M3, where M3 is an arbitrary admissible three manifold. So that's a nice asymptotic formula. It's especially interesting in the context where the three manifold is a three sphere. For the three sphere, this partition function has an interpretation in terms of counting short representations of the superconformal group, so BPS operators. So now I can more or less tell you precisely if you start when you start from an n equals one supersymmetric field theory in four dimensions, there are many BPS operators which are bosonic, there are BPS operators which are fermionic. Those uh, short they form some short representations, and now if we sum over them, we can infer what is the high temperature limit or the small beta limit. And that's given by the A minus C anomaly. And this formula is the, ma the one that seems most strikingly similar to a Cardi formula in two dimensions. So the sum, the, the sum over operators, which are in short representations in four dimensions, where fermions are counted with a minus sign, has a nice asymptotic limit, which depends only on the A minus C anomaly, which is just the U1R gravitational anomaly in superconformal filters. So I've just used this relation to express the, the answer in terms of A minus C. And the coefficients are completely universal and calculable, and that teaches you quite a bit about uh, 
uh, superconformal representations, the prop depending on A minus and A minus C here appears very naturally. You can also add chemical potential for angular momentum, so you can decide to weight your operators also with some angular momentum quantum numbers, and there's a very simple generalization of this formula, which I'm not going to discuss. Now let me discuss the applications. One interesting philosophical uh, application of this result is that to compute the A minus C anomalies, you do not need to go to three-point functions. If you just know the full spectrum of short representations of your superconformal field theory, then you're done. From the asymptotics, you can find out what's A minus C. That's interesting because the usual definition of A minus C goes through some three-point functions, but apparently it's not needed. Now, people have been computing G-string corrections in ADS, and they found something that seems very similar to this claim. They found that uh, the corrections in string perturbation theory do not depend on representations which are not protected. So that's consistent with the claim. And of course, there are many examples where the partition function S3 has been recently computed. And in examples where it was done, you can see that this asymptotic formula is correct. Now, another interesting lesson is that uh, in general, there are many, infinitely many BPS operators which are bosonic and infinitely many BPS operators which are fermionic. So this uh, beta going to zero limit is like saying that you want to count all the bosonic operators minus all the fermionic BPS operators. So if C minus A is positive, it means that you're, you have infinitely many bosonic operators minus infinitely many fermionic operators. And infinity min minus infinity is generically infinity, and that's consistent. And that's the case if C minus A is positive. Because if C minus A is positive, you see that this thing uh, blows up in this small circle limit. And that's consistent. If A is equal to C, like in N equals 4, or in Einstein gravity in ADS5, then out of infinity minus infinity, only a finite number of states remains which seems fine-tuned, but okay, it's A minus A equals zero. The most interesting conclusion is that if the sign is wrong in some sense, so if C minus A is negative, then infinity minus infinity conspires to give you exactly zero. And the reason is that if the sign is wrong, this decays exponentially fast in the small circle limit. This may explain why models in with C minus A, which is negative, are extremely rare. So if you've ever tried to construct supersymmetric quantum filters with various values of C minus A, you might have noticed that all of them have, almost all of them have the same sign for C minus A except for one or two examples. So that might, might explain why this, uh, uh, this is true. Another uh, application that I would like to mention is that from this it follows that if I minus C is non-zero, then you must modify the spectrum of your BPS operator. So it cannot be just Einstein gravity. And that may be related to some recent work that's still uh, unpublished or in progress by these people. Okay, just a few open questions and then I'm done. Uh, of course, one can try to go to higher orders in the temperature expansion. So I've just talked about the U1 gravitational anomaly, but it's very likely that all the other anomalies appear as well at higher orders in the temperature expansion. Uh, <clears throat> you can try to, one of the most interesting applications is to generalize this story to six dimensions because that would provide an a priori new way to derive anomalies, to derive the anomalies of various 1,0 theories in six dimensions. There is no other field theoretic derivation, as far as I know, and that would provide a, a very rigorous way to extract these anomalies from, from, a, for, from the supersymmetric index. So that would be nice. We could uh, compute the anomalies and compare with other methods. And uh, finally, it seems not very far from a statement about the fact that C minus A needs to be positive or non-negative in quantum filters of a certain type, because the Winton index vanishes in those which have the wrong sign, which is suggest so this is suggestive, but such an argument does not yet exist. Also, there are some discussions in the recent literature between connect of what is the precise nature of the connection between the partition function over operators and the partition function over the geometry. So even though they seem naively to be related maybe by some Casimir energies and local counter terms, some recent computations suggest that there may be more to the story. And uh, this is all for now. Thanks. Questions? Oh. Wait for the microphone. I, I did not hear, sorry. Unitary bound. Uh, unitarity assumption uh, of uh, four dimensional theory, unitarity. Unitarity, uh, <clears throat> okay. If you, if you are willing to buy this result, that, uh, sorry, 
If you're willing to buy this result, that the coefficient of this chern simons term is universally fixed in terms of the U1 gravitational anomaly, then, you're in, then everything follows. Okay. Now, the proof, of this result, the, the proof of this result for Lagrangian field theories did not depend on unitarities. Now, the non-perturbative proof that I promised you but did not show, it's actually here in the slides after the thanks. So there is, there is a non-perturbative proof that goes through exchanging the hop, the hop fiber with the thermal circle, which looks uh, very similar to various discussions in two dimensions. This proof assumes, assumes some form of reflection positivity. So that's the only place where unitarity may potentially enter, but there might be another proof that does not even need to assume reflection positivity. For Lagrangian filters, unitarity was not important. More questions? Right, well, let's uh, thank Sohar.